Monastery's live stream. I am Ajahn Sona, and we shall proceed with the first question. Yes, Ajahn. The first question is from the live chat from Joy. Is it okay to practice a Subha Bhavana as the main practice? I'm a little worried because the monks who first practiced that in the past committed suicide. I wanted to ask you because I think it helps me get rid of my desires. Well, let's define Asubha Bhavana for the worldwide audience. <laughs> uh, Subha means beautiful. Asubha means not beautiful. And we could say the repulsive as well. Bhavana means to cultivate, uh, meaning to meditate on to cultivate a perception, uh, more or less a realistic perception, primarily of the body itself. And the body itself, I mean, we have a huge world media structure, which is, uh, per, you know, preoccupied with uh, beauty, the body and so forth, drives half the population mad, <laughs> trying to be beautiful all the time. <clears throat> the Buddha is saying, you know, let's get real about the nature of the body. Uh, because if you're, you know, you can get obsessed with uh, beauty. People are ex obsessed with it. They're looking for, they're, they're focusing on, on aspects of the body that they consider beautiful, but they're extracting a certain small portion of the body out of the whole body. <clears throat> People don't fall in love with your intestines. They, they don't fall in love with your blood. Or the other v fluids within your body. <laughs> uh, just think about it. <laughs> so the Buddha, primarily this is, this teaching is primarily to monks. And you can, you can perhaps understand why that would be. Monks have to live a celibate life. And it's not merely absence of sexual activity. It's uh, learning to be free of uh, sexual desire. <clears throat> not just sexual desire, but also just attraction and uh you know, romantic interest, uh, or even obsession with uh, the beauty of, of bodies. Um, <clears throat> in order, uh, so this is very much against the modern ideas uh, about romance, uh, sexuality, etc. Um, it is good to hear about this. Uh, the world should uh, be aware that. Uh, this, there was a kind of a period, uh, I think, perhaps uh, in the early, late 19th century, the Victorian era, of course, the f famous prudery of the Victorian era, which spread throughout the world as well. And uh, <clears throat> this was considered uh, somehow problematic for people. Uh, you remember Freud and his old concern for mental well-being because of the uh, repression and suppression of of these natural instincts. So there was a <clears throat> a bit of a revolution, a bit of a revolution in uh, in their attitudes towards this in the modern world and. <clears throat> Sort of, they, they thought it was a liberation, but it's it's not a liberation, unfortunately. There's two things which is just it's not just a matter of pretending and suppression, or <clears throat> being honest and open and indulgent. These are both uh, bad strategies. There is a problem with with desire itself. So this is one of the primary problems the Buddha sees, which creates suffering. As you can see, uh, uh, if people don't get what they want, they live a life of frustration. And you, you see this, there's all kinds of modern um, 
instances of this, <clears throat> the, um, the allure of the media is everywhere and it's, it's telling you that uh, all about the beautiful people and all about how happy everybody is and how it's such connections can be made and so forth. But uh, not everybody can make these connections and live the beautiful life. <laughs> and so <clears throat> you have a whole portion of the population that is deeply distressed about this. They want to play the game too because it says right on TV that it's really fun. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's all wonderful. You can go to the bar and, and uh, make casual uh, romantic relationships uh, and it's beautiful and wonderful. And it's, of course, it's not that way. Uh, a lot of the suffering in life, uh, the tragedies of life are uh, uh, failed romance, uh, unrequited love. The, of course, they used to write poems about this. <laughs> Look up Shakespeare, unrequited love. Uh, so <clears throat> it's, a, it's a minefield which can devastate the human mind. And if you get wrong representations about this, wrong direction about this, you, you're just going to wade into the swamp land of suffering. <laughs> So this is <clears throat> something to think about. Why would the Buddha suggest that monks uh, abandon desire for uh, an attraction to the body itself? Uh, just to be free from this uh, sense of debt. Now, <clears throat> desire is a form of debt. So when you, when you want something, you go into debt. You don't you 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 have to do something to get that thing. You're you're in a state of lack. So debt is below zero. You're below zero when you're when you want something. <clears throat> and in, in money terms, when you when you borrow money, you have to pay it back. And the debt weighs on you. <clears throat> so uh, desire is a form of lack. And the moment you want something is the moment you lack it. You feel un, not complete without it. So the Buddha's aim for the teaching the monks, and of course he's he's already accomplished this himself, is he's he's a complete person. He's a whole person. He's a he's somebody who is not experiencing lack, thirst, uh, partialness in life. He's, he's uh, full and complete. Uh, by the way, this word holy, H-O-L-Y, which is <clears throat> uh, an English, an old English word, is the early spelling of the word W-H-O-L-E, whole. So a holy person is somebody who's sort of complete. <clears throat> uh, wholeness through uh, a view of life. So when we practice this asuba, the, this reflection on the unbeautiful, it is to um, it is to dissuade us from cravings and feeling a sense of lack. Uh, people get obsessed with all kinds of things. People are obsessed with uh, sports cars and obsessed with uh, big houses, obsessed with beauty or possessing uh, all kinds of items that they, they feel are, would, would complete them, would give them happiness. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it, it's quite a job to collect all these beautiful things that you want. And <clears throat> when you actually get them, you may find out that it wasn't so great after all. But the Buddha is suggesting a different strategy where to want nothing is to have everything. You feel you feel that you that you lack nothing. So it's a it's a brilliant strategy for reversing this. Instead of chasing around after these things you want, question your your perception about what is desirable. And if you can realize that it's not maybe there's more to it than the desirable aspect. Then the 
then reality comes into uh, play and you feel that the desire falls away. And when the desire falls away, you feel a sense of completion. So this is what the, the Buddha was up to with this. The monks who took it up, uh, by the way, it wasn't, you know, all the monks didn't commit suicide. Some, some did. It was a, it's a strange story, but <clears throat> yes, you can mishandle this reflection on the repulsive. And you see it in uh, modern psychology. People get aversive to their own bodies. They, they, did, they see only the fault, only the bad aspects of their own bodies. And this is a total distortion of perception as well. Um, or they, they are rep repelled or repulsed by other uh, people's bodies. <clears throat> and this is the wrong attitude as well. That's just a form of aversion or of, of some mild form of hatred, actually. So you're neither to hate your body or, uh, and the bodies of others or to be obsessed by them. You are to become realistic about it. You are to see it. Now, you don't have to focus on the really repulsive parts of the body necessarily, but you can, uh, because people get carried away with this. They, they, they can't properly see their own body. This, this happens in anorexia and so forth, people staring in the mirror, and they see a fat person in there when they really are way underweight, and it, it's, it leads to craziness. And so um, what you're trying to do is strategize about a truly holy and healthy attitude to your body and the bodies of others. Uh, I suggest for, especially for Westerners who seem to be very um, tragically um, distorted in their body image, their sense of their own body and the bodies of others, that uh, because of the dangers of, you know, becoming pathological about the body, that you reflect uh, on the four elements, that the body is made out of water and air and, and earth and heat or fire, what we say fire. The four elements are quite neutral. We see we see that the body, what it is constructed of, we, we, uh, we have to drink uh, water. Uh, it is mostly seawater. You know, it is, what did they say? You're 96% ocean water with a little bit of red dye in it. <laughs> the iron turns it red. Um, so you're mostly salt water and... Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit of coral in there. The bones are, are just coral. Um, and, of course, we, we eat the earth. Uh, have you noticed? So you put a seed into the earth and out pops a cabbage or a carrot or an avocado or something like that. Blueberries. It's all just earth. It just, it, they're strictly made out of dirt. <laughs> they're, they, uh, somehow the seed transforms the inorganic to the organic, and you can then take this new form of earth and put it right into your body, and that is the earth element in your body. So you can, you can play with reality like this. Of course, this is, this is reality. Uh, you are just water and solids, liquids and solids, and heat, 37, whatever it is, degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. There's some sort of chemical reaction going on that maintains the heat in your body. And then you're, you, of course, need to breathe all the time. And that is the air. The air is entering you and leaving you. When you breathe in, you call the air inside you, you. But when you breathe out, you departs into the atmosphere. So this is, this is actually a great exercise, uh, perhaps better than the asuba, which is looking at the squishy, squashy parts of you and the, the various types of liquids. Uh, so it's, it's more 
more uh, acceptable. It, it's unlikely to lead to any kind of pathology. But it gets you back in touch, and it's, it's a great uh, freedom of, from burden, you know. Um, we, we become much more just compassionate to other people's... Uh, the way other people's bodies are. It's just, uh, it's just the earth walking around. Um, there's a saying uh, about the nature of the evolution of the body, more or less that a, a wave, one day a wave rolled up on the beach, got up and walked away. And that's what your body is. It's, it's a bag of seaweed and uh, seawater. Seaweed is the skin and coral for bones and ocean water for the rest of the liquids. Quite beautiful. The ocean is walking around and singing opera. <laughs> Uh, we can we can return it to this, and this is this is not fantasy. This is this is uh, scientific reality. This is what we are. Not to get carried away by this, just allow it to be in a natural way. You know, relate to bodies as as bags of seawater. There's nothing ter bad about bags of seawater. It's amazing they can dance and they can jump and they walk around and get things done, etc. But if we see it that way, we become, our, our psychology, our emotional life becomes very much at ease with reality. Yeah. Okay, well, next question. The next question is also from the live chat from Zuri. Greetings, Lumpur. My practice was really good during COVID due to all the available time, but has since declined. At my peak, I was doing 20 to 45 minutes of sitting twice per day, but now it is merely about 15 minutes of walking meditation. Could you provide some suggestions for intensifying and reinvigorating my practice? Well, at some point we have to uh, lay the law down for ourselves and just set aside a, a reasonable period. When you're in a lucid condition, you have to say, look, what do you... Please tell me why I don't have a half an hour in my life to meditate. <laughs> how, how, how is that possible? <laughs> you just have to <clears throat> face the truth is that we play around and fiddle around and evaporate time and uh, distract ourselves. And we have plenty of time, actually. And it's very valuable. So we, we just have to say, okay, here's the, set the time. Here's the clock. Uh, clear your schedule so that you're not feeling guilty or, and you don't leave it up to a impulse. If you leave it up to impulse, then you just won't get around to it. So it's got to be scheduled in. It's a it's a duty to be done, and it's for the your the sake of the in, the better quality of your life. It's like putting some money in the bank for later. You know, like you can't just waltz around and spend it all. You have to put some away, and it has to come out of your check. It can't be spent. It has to go into the bank. And if you, some people don't, and uh, they're sorry about it later. <laughs> Where'd all the money go? But <clears throat> others, they're told that this is how it has to be. A certain amount of money has to be put away uh, for uh, long-term benefit. And this is what meditation is, is that a certain amount of time has to be uh, used for the long-term benefit of your life, your emotional life, your well-being in life. And that has to be done on a regular basis, and you have to make that commitment. And that just, you just make it, it's just something that must be done. And of course, it's not necessarily going to be unenjoyable. It's, it, it may turn out to be just the most wonderful thing you've ever done. And Strictly speaking, I would say it, it is one of the, it is the most valuable skill one can learn. It is, it is because our life is just a simile for actually how our mind works and our mind uh, and emotional structure is, is what the experience of life is. And if, if our m mental and emotional structure is, is uh, used in a wise and healthy way, then our life is, is good. And if we don't do that, if we, if we haven't trained the mind, 
and the emotional structure, then our life won't be, it can't be good because life is the life of the mind and the heart. So we just have to uh, be our own teacher and set down, this is what, <laughs> this is the amount that goes into the bank every week and this is the amount of time spent per day for meditation. Yeah. The next question is from the live chat from Parp Chilakorn. Ajahn, how does one overcome ex boredom and excessive phone use? Boredom, yes. Boredom is a uh, lack of interest. And so, it, in fact, uh, what happens is people, this is the general psychology, is that uh, people th uh, feel bored, so they want more stimulation. And now, why do you want more stimulation? In order to catch your attention, make something interesting. But this weakens your capacity for attention, actually. It goes the wrong direction. Uh, this is the natural human tendency. Uh, this is the same with, uh, you know, eating uh, disorders and everything. You, you have a moment of pleasure from eating, so you put another thing in your mouth. You don't feel hungry anymore, but you just put another thing in your mouth because uh, life is not interesting without that. So there's all kinds of ways of catching our attention. So it's just food. So there's the food of the senses. Uh, on, the, on the phone, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Surfing the, the web and so forth and talking to people is, is a form of food. And it's not, it's food that is not required. Some food is required. Food is required. Intellectual content is required, skills are required, and you have to do those things and learn those things. But you, your, your interest in life, the sense of interest and non-boredom is counterintuitive. This is why we do meditation on objects like the breath. So we pay attention to the breath because it's not interesting. <laughs> It's, it's not disgusting, it's not, it's not interesting either. But if you train your, your mind to pay attention and not wander and seek strong stimulation, you know, uh, it wants to go to the party, it wants to go to the circus, it wants to do this and that, because it has gratification at that time, but the, the gratification doesn't come from those events, it comes from the fact that your mind is interested. So what you want to do is strengthen your capacity for interest in very, very ordinary life. And so you, you practice with your breath. You watch your breath and see if you can pay attention. The, keep your attention there, the entire exhalation, the entire inhalation, just watching it flow through the nose, keeping your attention on it in breath, out breath, nothing else in the whole world. Mind starts calming down and the mind starts becoming more refined, more serene, more, more happy and complete in very ordinary life. And then the boredom dissipates. The boredom dissipates. And that is how you do it. And that's the opposite. It's, this is People wonder, why, why do you meditate? What, what's that all about? Uh, I would rather go out to the circus. Uh, I want to go out to a nightclub, something like that. They don't understand the nature of the mind because these experiences become sh shallower and shallower. Your attention capacity gets shorter and shorter and life becomes less and less satisfactory. And it never occurs. So uh, be, what people do is they take... Uh, strong stimulants like drugs and so forth in order to make it to add a dimension of interest to life uh, because life becomes so uninteresting so problematic that they need something to alleviate that distress so this is the this is the nature and of course the dose has to be keep you, you keep increasing the dose and it keeps uh, the effect keeps getting weaker and weaker so we have to go in the opposite direction we have to stop the drugs we have to stop the stimulants. We have to stop the endless dwelling in, uh, in, in sense 
a stimulation. We have to get back to a simpler thing. And this, the, the mind will resist this. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't want to do this because it, it can't pay attention and it can't find the breath interesting. But nevertheless, we have to sit down and go through that uncomfortable period. And we will notice that the mind is very unkempt, wild, un disobedient. We will notice it. it. It won't do what we want. And, but we can't give up on this. This is the way to well-being and happiness. So we, we consistently practice this, slowing down, paying attention to the very, very ordinary, and then your life starts to become richer. The ordinary part of your life, it, it's your ordinary life becomes totally okay, yeah. You stop wanting something more because what you have seems to be plenty. So that's how you do it. Okay, let's go to the next question. Meta. Uh, let's go back here. I, I tricked Meta. I, I told her to go to the next question, and then she pushed the button, and then... <laughs> so Meta is asking the questions today. Pia is in town. Um, and so we are, we are. That's the 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 new voice in the background there. You've heard Meta. Meta normally operates the, the microphones and the cameras and stuff, but she has to do everything. She's juggling today. Uh, this is, she's joined the circus. Um, by the way, I want to mention that next week, we will have the live stream at this time. <coughs> but. Uh, it will be pre-recorded. <laughs> and what we want you to do is submit your questions ahead of time. In the... Where, Meta? Where, where do we uh, do that? In the description for the live stream, there's a link. So if you look at the description, and Pia will go ahead and paste that in the chat, which is for the pre-submitted questions. You can ask your question there for next week for the pre-recording. Right, so the, the que it will be, I will be answering your questions, you will submit them, but uh, Meta has to go off to uh, town, Va Vancouver, next week, so we, we can't operate this elaborate <laughs> studio without her. <laughs> so we have to pre-record it, but you will still have your questions answered and it will, all appear at the regular time, 9 a.m. Pacific time on Saturday, next Saturday, next, next Sunday, sorry, next Sunday. And in fact, it will appear in, in high quality because we have a chance to pre-record it. When we do these live streams, we're going through a satellite. And every now and then you will notice that the, the little portions of the of the stream just get vanish. Uh, and, and quite often it's in the middle, I'm, I'm answering a question, I'm making an important point and it's gone. <laughs> so when we pre-record it, it, we can avoid that issue and have it all complete. And then we upload it. But we also like the uh, opportunity to, to have a live community throughout the world at different time zones. So this is a little explanation of what's going to happen next week. I'll mention this at the end of the talk as well uh, about submitting your questions for next week's pseudo live stream. Okay, Meta, let's go on to the next question. Okay, Aja. And then the one thing I'll also say too about next week is that the, um, the video will look like a premiere so that we can uh, have it look live. So there'll be the two minute countdown timer that I think some of you are used to having attended our virtual retreats. So there'll be a page available just like a live stream, probably the day before. And then you can just go to that page and it will start up. Um, I think it starts the countdown at 
uh, 9 a.m. So just hang out through that. It's usually a minute. And then the video will start. Uh, there's a live chat for the premiere, but we won't be answering questions in that chat. So the, the, the video will be pre-recorded. The questions will be, um, you know, pre-submitted. So that's the, the deal for next week. So the next question is from the live chat from Sumina. I have increasing crankiness with my son's mental illness. I have practiced decades, yet the intention for patience is not holding at this time. In need of the wide voice from someone who knows me. Yeah, but what you need is compassion for yourself. Uh, you need to relax because, you, as you say, you've been at this for decades. <clears throat> and uh, it's probably not going to fix itself tomorrow either. <laughs> so you have to say, okay, this is a very long-term process. I can uh, be impatient, worried, resentful um, about it, but if I do, I will suffer. And it probably, well, it, it, it won't help. So I could, I must... Uh, realize that I'm, I'm not helping the situation for my son and I'm not helping the situation for myself by these emotions and attitudes. So, but at the same time, I'm not giving up. I'm not abandoning responsibilities. Um, I, I'm committed to this through love. I'm committed to, um, helping and, uh, doing what I can th because of love. And, but I am going to stick with that as my motivation. Uh, it's, it's because of love. It's not, uh, and then it will be okay. I, I, I will live richly and well with that emotion. And that emotion does, is very, in, and it's an ingenious emotion. It, it, quite often comes up with solutions for situation, medical situations, difficult social situations that impatience and anger can't come up with. So I'm going to rely on the ingenuity of, of goodwill and loving kindness to solve my problem for me. And <clears throat> it's primarily going to probably dissolve some of the uh, impossible demands. So sometimes when somebody else has mental issues, health issues, we want them solved, but that turns out to be not possible. And so we've asked ourselves the wrong question, how do I solve this situation? Well, we don't. Uh, but we can dissolve the impossible demand to fix the situation or make it right or to make it work out well in the end. We, we, loving kindness will tell us uh, that this is the situation of this weird thing we call life and the people in our lives, they often don't get better. And often there's not the right help available and such a situation like this and it's only in uh, movies and stories where everything works out in the end so we have to abandon those kind of unrealistic ideas and say no uh, it, i have to be okay with the universe it doesn't doesn't seem to play fair and doesn't uh seem to go according to the proper movie script. So I have to learn to relax in the midst of this as that it's really, I have to give up running the universe. Uh, it, it's just a little bit too much uh, work. <laughs> I have to quit insisting that the universe behave itself properly and that people uh, and uh, social situations uh, behave themselves so I stop doing this. I, I stop with my expectations of success and I stop with uh, concern over failures as well. And, uh, I, and then what happens is the world just goes on as it did before, but you are not 
strained and stressed by it. You are now a, an observer of the world, a kindly and serene observer of the world. And by no means are you not uh, proactive or doing anything, uh, but you will do things with the right emotions. And then uh, you will sleep well, and you are, your mind will be relaxed, and you will do the best you can, uh, given the situation. But it's this strain, stress and strain, uh, frustrations with systems and people, etc., that, that create uh, the, the problem. But we can undo that. And uh, we, we just need a lot of reminders. So when you need a reminder, save this clip. <laughs> okay, next question. The next question is from the live chat from Tyler from Tennessee, United States. Would you please give some tips for responding in a skillful way when someone is being unskillful in speech in a one-on-one -on -one conversation? I think you have to start before the conversations, maybe in the beginning of the day, to remind yourself that all kinds of people have very poor skills in, in what they say and their attitudes. They, they don't have the benefit of wise training. Uh, they, they are, uh, it, it's family dynamics or the way they were educated or raised or <clears throat> what they're listening to on their uh, <clears throat> their um, their searches on Google, etc. Uh, the, by the way, uh, speech uh, these days is quite inflamed, and uh, and there's a lot of wrong speech out there, and most people don't recognize what what is right speech and what is wrong speech. What what contributes to well-being and peace in the world, and what contributes to uh, more um, suffering and violence in the world. <clears throat> so you have to start in the morning and say, well, th this is not my problem. I, I don't run the universe. So I, I have to focus on my own right speech. And I have to be detached from the fact that uh, other people, I can't wish that other people would learn this. They, it's up to them. So I'm going to encounter wrong speech today. And I'm, <clears throat> I could, I can receive it with good humor. I, I can see that this person is, it's something like somebody who doesn't know how to walk properly. Uh, it's, it's just a peculiar <clears throat> feature. There, there are ways of doing it, but it's not your problem. They'll have to learn how to walk. They'll have to learn how to speak. And you can be kindly in this. You can think also of yourself as a social worker or a psychiatric uh, nurse, <laughs> you know, if you're a psych nurse, uh, what do you think happens in psych wards? Do people speak uh, properly all the time? Uh, no. And so, should the psych? How should the psych nurse respond to this? Well, they they they're trained to respond. That this person is having trouble with their mind, you know. So. Your job is to be compassionate and understanding the mind is not working right, not to react, not to be uh, insulted because this person who is in a manic episode in the hospital is saying wild things to you. Uh, uh, hopefully the police are actually uh, trained this way as well. When you, when you encounter a domestic dispute where a lot of drugs and alcohol are involved and there's a 20-year history of of dysfunction, those people, uh, the police will be told, uh, you know, the person, the policeman in training will be told, look, they're going to, they might spit at you. They will shout and call you names. They will blame you for everything. And it is, you must understand it's not personal. That person is in a state of hostility and confusion and whatever they say to you, it is not about you. And in order to not burn out in such a situation, you must don't take it personally. 
and, res- and respond, and they train them to respond. They, they, they don't uh, use harsh language with the people. Usually they just call them sir or ma'am, please sit down, ma'am, please, sir, <laughs> stop what you're doing. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the response. This is you're teaching people in these helping professions to be philosophers. This is what the great philosophers, how they respond to the world. So you also have to be a philosopher. You're going to recognize wrong speech and that you can't necessarily correct it. Uh, you can, but if your response is, is balanced and so forth, quite often the person will recognize that, oh, uh, I'm, uh, maybe I'm not in a fight. Maybe I'm not in an insult trade kind of situation. So just by being calm and lucid yourself and being polite, uh, it may reduce the whole atmosphere of wrong speech in the other person. Yeah. <clears throat> the next chat question is from the live chat from Rajinder. Greetings from California. Bonte, could you please give some methods to pre- preserve our energy and channel it towards achieving our goals? Yes, that's a very important skill to learn. You will find uh, it's about psychic energy. And this is a learning process. Uh, Learning not to switch to uh, modes which deplete your your energy supply. And so both greed and uh, aversion are uh, huge ghost draws on your battery system. They, they are depleting your mental energies and they're not necessary. So what we realize that energy, uh, goodwill is a fountain of energy. Equanimity also is a fountain of, equanim- of uh, energy. It, it uh, preserves whatever energies you have. <clears throat> and mental energies are uh, very connected to bodily energies. You can see people who are Olympic athletes who uh, fall into depression uh, and then they can't get up out of bed. <clears throat> now, how, how is somebody who can run a marathon or lift uh, enormous weights can't get their body out of bed? Well, that's psychic uh, distress and uh, a lack of energy, which comes from these negative emotions. So you can see the source of uh, depletion of energy is negative emotion. <clears throat> One type of negative emotion that when you're trying to succeed and, and, and accomplish something is the, is the idea that, that you must try hard. Uh, this, this is just creating tension in your body and mind. Trying hard is not how you succeed. Uh, putting in the causes for success is how you succeed. And, you know, I talk to university students sometimes or any student, uh, quite often they think, you know, I've got to, I've got to try to pass this test. And they go in anxiously and trying to pass the test. But this is futile. How do you pass a test? You, by knowing the answers. But how do you know the answers? You read ahead of time, what they are. (laughs) You find out what the answers are so that you can answer it. And no amount of trying will help you. You you, you don't learn the answers by trying. You learn the answers by reading and listening. And listening and reading are not something that requires like effort or attention. It requires that you simply do this very light exercise of scanning the words with your eyes, asking yourself, what did I just read? Uh, Maybe you have to do it two or three or four times, but it's not a matter of tension or stress. It's just a matter of repetition until it becomes clear. And that's, so you put in the causes for success and the causes are never tension in your body or tension in your mind or anger or greed. 
um, none of those uh, produce success. <clears throat> you may think they do. You may think, oh, it's because I tried so hard. I stayed up till three in the morning. I was so tired and I was, I was afraid. Maybe I, it's because I'm afraid to fail. That's why I succeed. No, 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 no. None of those are the reasons why you succeed. You succeed because the causes have been put in and the causes do not require fear, anxiety, uh, greed, um, uh, excitement, or any of those things. That's not the cause of success. The cause is that you put in the correct, the cause of success are the correct causes. <laughs> and it's, if it's a knowledge field, then it's simply a matter of reading, rehearsing, and training. And those are not something that burns you out or depletes you. It, it, it's uh, something that is just done in a systematic uh, way. Yeah. <clears throat> The next question is from the live chat from Shivali. Dear Ajahn, I am new to Buddhism. I want to know whether I can work on the path to happiness even while having a family and related aspirations. Well, uh, you need to work on the path to happiness because you have a family and aspirations. <laughs> it's all the more reason you need to... Uh, <clears throat> find the time for this. Be now, say monastics uh, choose a lifestyle which is outside of the the family structure and various uh, work uh, demands and so forth because it 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 is uh, easier. Uh, but. The people who remain in the, the household life and the family life and everything, the, the, they can't just not deal with their own well-being and happiness. They, they also need a commitment to that. Uh, and because you have these other distractions, it, it, it's all the more important that you pursue the path and you, that you find time for it because it will benefit you. It's not something that's a it's not something a negative thing that you have to do. It's not like a bad job that you have to go to. <laughs> Some when we have a bad job that we have to go to because we need the money, we got three kids, and we're the sole support, and we have to do it, and we don't like it, but we have to do it. That's not what the the path is. It's it's the thing that makes it possible to continue to go to the bad job because you really have to do it and not suffer excessively. So this is, the path has to be thought of as, as a beautiful thing. And the Buddha took, put it in this words, the path is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. So look for its beauty and enhancing the beautiful qualities of your life as well. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next question, Meta. Yes, so to piggyback on that a little bit, so the next question is from James. He says, hello from Kelowna, Canada. Very grateful to have found this channel. Do you have recommended playlists for beginner householders with less than two years experience? Yes, I have uh, <clears throat> the whole YouTube channel. My whole... My whole monastic life has been about this part teaching. So I blundered into teaching. I, the moment I was ordained, my I happened to be ordained uh, in uh, uh, West Virginia at the Bhavana Society with uh, Bhante Gunaratana, very uh, uh, high, highly esteemed uh, monastic, and. He he was he, he was and is a, a great teacher and spent his much of his monastic life going around the world teaching, and of course he has many books out as well and uh, g g given endless retreats and so forth. And his attitude was that uh, if he ordained a monk, they should uh, they should 
start expressing the Dhamma. So it wasn't very long into the robes that he started, you know, tell me, okay, you're going to give a talk tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So I had to think about it. Now, actually, I have been a teacher previously in uh, music. And so uh, music teaching is, is very well organized and, and systematic as well. So I realize how things develop. And um, it's, it's usually like um, an encyclopedia where you give a brief uh, overview and then you follow with an article that is of medium length that explores the details more. And then you give references for what we would call exhaustive explorations, not exhausting, <laughs> but that give all of the details, all of the possible knowledge on it. So this is the way I organize this, uh, my YouTube channel as well. So what you'll find is that there's a series of early uh, videos that I made that are about, you know, maybe eight minutes long on the various core topics and their introductions. They're enough to get you started and without overwhelming you with information. So this is part of good teaching is that speak simply and clearly to begin. Don't uh, overwhelm people with uh, information. Give them enough to get a start and try not to make it painful. <laughs> Then there's moderate length ones, you know, talks that uh, a single talk on a subject may be 30 to 45 minutes long. And then after that, there are series of talks, maybe 10 talks on a single topic. So I, I give to say 10 talks on just on loving kindness, where I have lots of time, I have eight to 10 hours uh, to explore all the details of it, where, how it occurs in the teachings of the Buddha, etc. So all of these topics, I try to do it in brief uh, summary, uh, a moderate exposition on it, and then a complete uh, explanation of the, all of the detail, details. And that's how the the beginner should approach it. Start with the basics in, in a, succinct, a succinct, brief form, then go to the next um, middle length uh, uh, exposition on it. And then finally, if you're still interested and want to explore it more and you have the time for it, then go to the full series of talks, There's, you know, 10 talks in a row, 10, 12 talks in a row. <clears throat> And by the end of that, there are 300 talks on this uh, YouTube channel. If you if you listen to all of them, uh, then you will have you'll be a very well informed uh, Buddhist. Uh, and this is the in a sense the marvel of uh, our times uh, having access to this information. This was never possible before. Uh, the the books that were written uh, before or available and so forth were quite often inadequate and hard to get a hold of, and then. Uh, the wrong sort of order. and So now we have free free access to all of this uh, on uh, these type of platforms, YouTube and so forth. I, I have podcasts as well. And you can, you know, of course, you can listen to this as you're driving to work and you can listen to this oh, falling to sleep and so forth. You, you know, so this is an incredible time for the distribution of information about Buddhism, which had formerly been a very, very uh, esoteric, mystical, badly explained or hard to get a hold of type of information before, and now is is coming into full uh, full access for for anybody on the planet for free, which is just great. <clears throat> okay, I think we have time for one more question, Meta Pi. Yes, Ajahn Sona. The last question today is also from the live chat from Sophia. Dear Ajahn, how should I meditate if I have borderline personality disorder? Yeah, I, <clears throat> borderline is uh, 
uh, has difficulties to it. Uh, borderline personality is dependency issues and so forth, social issues. Uh, and meditation is very uh, good for that particular personality uh, structure. Uh, uh, it's good. Meditation is good for anybody who can do it. Quite often people are, they say, I'm meditating, but they're not actually meditating. They're just drifting. But anyway, if you can actually systematically sit down and meditate, it, it, it is very, very good for that personality structure. There are some uh, uh, studies by psychologists, systematic studies with uh, borderline uh, and uh, the effects of mindfulness practices on that condition. And apparently it's, uh, according to the, that psychologist, uh, is quite effective. The, of course, first of all, loving kindness is, is one of the great, um, the great medicines for all of these conditions. Uh, it changes your, your social relate, your sense of con self-confidence and your sense of independence and your, your own sense of well-being. And in borderline, this is usually the roots of this condition seem to be, you know, a, a, a great lack of, um, self-esteem, um, s sense of personal self-security, uh, and, uh, emotional well-being. So this is, uh, this is what loving kindness does. And you, it, it's independent of your, of the people around you. So you cultivate this, you, you immerse yourself you go to this, the loving kindness spa every day and you spend hours and hours and hours in the hot tub of loving kindness and the massage on the massage table of loving kindness. You, you have it worked into your system, relaxing every nerve in your body and giving yourself uh, nourishment through loving kindness, the food of loving kindness, the the bathing in loving kindness, all of these aspects, it's a beautiful thing and it will change your whole structure of your, of your mind. And probably they can even see it in, a, in, in, men, in brain scans. They will probably see structural changes in your brain. But this is a full immersion. You just spend, you have this you can have talks going on in, in your headphones there all day long. Just to, um, f feel free to listen to my talks on loving kindness. I'll talk you into it um, all day long, all night long. You can have talks going on. And so you really need to extru you know, bathe extremely in this um, to undo these uh, difficulties and problems. So it's the primary uh, medicine for this, you know. Okay, so we will um, end for today. And so I want to just reiterate that next week, it will not be a live stream. It'll appear as a premiere. And, but you will get to ask questions. You just pre-submit the questions to the link in the page right in front of you on the YouTube screen you're watching, there's a, a link to, what is it called? Uh, it's the, our pre-submitted question form. And we've just posted that in the chat as well. So if you grab that, you can submit a question. Right. And, and that will appear uh, in the next week's uh, pseudo live stream premiere. <laughs> and I made a note in the chat as well. If you want to ask a question, um, please do submit that by Thursday, because that's probably around when we will be recording it. Yeah, it has to be a couple of days before the uh, Sunday um, stream, because we have to pre-record it. Okay, well, that's it for this Sunday. <laughs>